So uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Pamela Dalal, and Ryan Turner is my co-director of the Bach Institute. Um, we have been running this program since last Wednesday um, with this wonderful group of fellows um, preparing uh, not only the cantata that we rehearsed this morning, but a cantata last weekend, and a showcase concert tomorrow evening. So our piece this weekend is Bieter 37, Wer da Gläubet und getauft wird. It is from Bach's first year in Leipzig. And um, I don't know whether any questions were floating in your mind as you were hearing it. Um, some people who know certain Bach cantatas almost expect to hear a chorale in the opening movement. This cantata does not have a chorale in the opening movement, but it is a biblical verse, right? And um, one of the explanations for that is just simply that the cantata, I mean, excuse me, the chorale opening chorus was a feature of his second year in Leipzig when he uh, undertook a, a really ambitious project of writing a chorale cantata every single Sunday. But in his first year in Leipzig, it's much more common to see a biblical verse as the opening text for the chorus. So we have this biblical verse. And as if any of you heard the conversation that I was having with Pamela Wirtz on Wednesday, you learned that this is only half of the biblical verse. The, the entire verse, which we do provide for you in our handout, it's Mark 16, chapter 16, verse 16. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. And not only do we hear only the first half of that set to music, but every time I do that chorus, I keep thinking, where's the other half of the chorus? <laughs> it, it feels troubling. It feels, um, it's such beautiful music. It's so radiant and joyful and full of texture. Um, but it sort of pivots back to the tonic so quickly and then it's just go gone. Um, I, in this particular case, it's not, there is no missing loop pages or measures. Um, it's just an odd choice that the composer makes to make such a short movement. Um, before I turn it over to our conductor, who I know you have a lot more to say about that, <coughs> I want to just walk you through the form of the cantata very quickly. Um, we have in the second movement uh, a tenor aria, as you heard, with um, very light scoring. If you were looking at a score, you might have been surprised that the music that you heard played was not what you saw in the score. And that is because it's a speculation that there was an obligato part that has been lost. So um, I think there's some evidence that it was violin. I think we, we can't even know that for certain. Um, but there are several different versions that exist um, that various people have reconstructed. So that's already a fascinating thing. So what you heard this morning was not entirely the work of J.S. Bach. In fact, the, the, the reconstruction we heard was by our principal guest conductor and dear friend, John Harbison. Um, moving on, we do have a chorale in this cantata. It's just not where we thought it would be, right? It's in this third movement, and it is a verse of the very beloved and joyous Wie schön leuchtet der Morgenstern, how brightly shines the morning star, as you might know as the hymn verse. Um, set in a sort of uh, rollicking duet form, chorale fantasia with the chorale tune uh, decorated in all the voices, um, soprano, alto, and continuo, um, with connecting material. So it doesn't sound just like a straight chorale. 
And then we move directly into uh, more somber material. I, and if you were at our rehearsal this morning, it's our habit to not rehearse the piece directly in order, but to go from the largest forces to the smaller forces. That's why um, you might have been confused uh, of why we're hearing the bass singing first, right? Um, but he has this um, rather stern message to tell us that don't trust in good works. You must believe alone. Faith is the only thing that's going to get you into heaven. And then gives us <clears throat> sort of a, 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 a serious but inspiring message about faith being the wings of the soul. So I'm going to let Ryan jump in here. Yeah. Um. Much, I mean, I said a lot about the piece in rehearsal, but partly talking to you all, partly talking to our, our, our guests here. Um, the opening chorus, as Pam said, does indeed feel a little truncated. Uh, and it always leads me to believe, since we're missing the violin part from the second movement, is there something else that we're missing? <laughs> Did he mean to set that second half of the text? which? Feels the, it always feels the need that, okay, where's the B section? The thorny middle section that talks about being condemned. But then again, I, I really do feel with an Ascension Day cantata, the point is um, a, a message of, of hope and the rewards of faith, the rewards of those who believe, which, of course, that gives us this <clears throat> bright key of A major, which String players, I bet you can say, probably not your favorite key to play in. Lots of, it's, it's bright. <laughs> um, what I find interesting is the way he, as Bach so often does, constructs the opening movement. There are so many what I call extra musical, extra musical baggage or material that's in there that one can only speculate how much Bach's congregation would have been able to unpack or decipher what was happening. Um, and I mentioned this in rehearsal, but I'm sure, especially to our guests, it wasn't necessarily audible. Um, that it starts out the oboe has this bum, bum, bee, which is the tune that then the choir sings later, this leap of the fort. That's one mode. The other mode, which I believe John Arbison writes about in his notes, is could be set to the text of Descent de Bla Bla. Let me try that again. Descent de Heiligen Saint Devot. These are the Holy Ten Commandments. And we see that in a, in a previous work, Cantata 77, where this idea of the law of Moses, the Holy Ten Commandments, in Cantata 77 is set is set as a cantus firmus in long notes of the bass. And so here we have it in short notes in this little motive that's bounced around throughout the entire cantata and that then also the singers get as well. The third motive we have, which this is the one that I think it's possible his congregation might have heard, and this ties us into the soprano alto duet, is the continual opening line is the Final to the final motive of the chorale tune that the soprano and alto sing. The Vishen Leuchter, Mordvichter, the eye of the descending light, is what the continual play, but he transforms it into triple time. Um, to me, it's a connection to, I mean, so March 25th is the Annunciation Sunday which is when the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and says, surprise, <laughs> <laughs> you are going to have the savior of the world. Um, so to me, this is a reference to how it all began in a way. That it was, and the Bishon Reichstag der Morgenstern, that chorale tune upon which Cantata One is based, was for the Annunciation Sunday on March 25th. So this is a reference in a way to that idea of that chorale tune, a reference to the Annunciation. So we hear the end of it there, and then of course when we get to 
the third movement, we hear it in the soprano and alto. Um, this is a very complex, complicated fabric in terms of balancing this opening movement. And we spent a lot of time trying to sort out the motives and what was primary material and what was secondary material. Um, it's pretty rich texture that he does. But it, when I stepped out to listen, and those of you that were there noticed, I stepped out a lot of times to listen to hear what the balance is like because our um, acoustic is such that what I hear up front, if I balanced everything and the articulation to be the way I wanted it to be where I was standing, it would probably be just a sort of blur of sound when you get further back because of the way our acoustic works. So it's always been the big challenge for me is to sort of dismiss in a way what I'm hearing and knowing that 20 feet back it changes in sound. So that's why a lot of times, especially in the continuum, they're asked to play louder and shorter, which at times may not feel incredibly gratifying where you are, but when it reaches out of the space, it takes care of itself in a way. <coughs> So then we go to the second movement, which, um, as Pam mentioned, we don't have the violin part for it. There are numerous realizations. If you listen to any recordings of this cantata, uh, Bob Levin, pianist and who's on our advisory board, sort of a member of the manual community, uh, former professor at Harvard, who has done all the realizations of all of the lost obligato. Um, John Elliott Gardner. He, Re reconstruction. Reconstruction, yeah. yes. Um, he, if you listen to any John Elliott Gardner recordings of lost, uh, of, when there's a reconstruction, it's done by Bob Levin, all of his. John has done all of them as well. And there are other, you can. Uh, Tom Koopman, the Austrian Baroque, uh, the realization, I'm sure you, you probably listened to all those recordings. That's his own realization, reconstruction of it. So, I mean, there are, the possibilities are endless of what it could be. I would just say that what I like about John's is I feel as though it is directly related to the text. And when he brings me in, this yum, ta -ga -dum, ta -ga -dum, that little skipping gesture, which we hear in the opening chorus. Yum, ta -ga -dum, ta -ga -dum, ta -ga -dum, ta -ga -dum, ta -ga -dum. I feel like there's a motivic connection from the opening chorus to that. And I always hear this skipping gesture in Bach as this sort of a, a, um, a gesture of joy. I mean, Albert Schweitzer, the Bach scholar, called it Bach's joy mode, the skipping gesture. And so it's nice when we hear it from one movement to the next. There's a sense of a through line that happens. Um, Pam and I were talking about this. It, it's always a challenge when you do any Bach that is somehow reconstructed and not completely, not completely Bach, of course. And there's a, almost a feeling of him looking forward to five or six years later when he was going to explore the galat or the popular style of the day. Um, that sort of lightness, and so much of it is diatonic. I mean, harmonically, it's not incredibly adventurous. Um, which, of course, so much of what Bach was being criticized in his first few years in Leipzig was about that he was too harmonically and chromatically adventurous. And they wanted more, you know, the more popular music. And to me, there's a popular feel to this. And it's almost a way of um, speaking directly to his congregation about this, as we call it, the badge, <laughs> badge of yeah. faith. And it's this. <laughs> idea too we talked about in the coaching is that the text here is almost like saying you're a member of the club. You got invited to the party. You're, you're in the in-group. And I think also the choice of this more popular style which speaks directly to the congregation which would have been more familiar. I think there's makes I've always felt that audience members when you hear something that is familiar or you can, it resonates with you there, it makes you feel important. <laughs> it makes you feel, oh, I know this. I know how this goes. So I think there's that connection as well, harmonically speaking. Did you want to add something? To yeah. Um, so this also came up on, on Wednesday evening, this um, sort of theological message that's going through this particular piece. Remember, 
This is for ascension, and ascension is, you know, after the 50 days after the resurrection when Jesus officially leaves the earth, right? Um, but we don't have any of that story here. Um, instead, what we have is this profound meditation on, you know, how we're going to get to heaven, how we're going to follow him, mm. right? And we are dealing with, as I, as I sort of alluded to, we'll get to it more, this, this idea of the, the importance of belief as opposed to just good action, right? Um, what, is, what matters is something that no outsider can see which is what is in your soul, what you truly hold in your heart. Um, it is, um, you know, I've, I've said many times, and it's one of my principal beliefs, is that Bach is really trying to change us with the way he writes music. And most of the time, um, he's disturbing us, or surprising us, or shocking us, or, get, or, or, or getting us off of our comfort zone. In this piece, I think it's very ingratiating. Mm -hmm. It's like what, what Ryan was saying, it, 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 the, the, the serene beauty of the tenor aria, it's sort of like, don't you want to be one of us? If we're having such a good time here, right? Um, there, there's, a, there's a sense of saying, you know, if you are one of the faithful, if you, if you have this wonderful true, you know, unshakable knowledge that, that God is your savior and that, you know, you are in this, then you're just going to feel so good, right? And you, Matthew, that's what you said. You said it just felt really good. Oh, it felt really good, yeah. Um, on, on that idea of being a part of the club, my, my first interpretation into this was trying to show that boastfulness of having the badge, but that wasn't working musically whatsoever. So after that, yeah, after that, I envisioned it being like an aristocrat. Like I had the elegance and the grace that comes with the badge, not sh vocally showing the badge itself. And with that, everything just really started to link in together, and this confidence and easiness and relatability just came and showed. Me. Yeah, and I, one other thing I didn't mention to you privately, so I will say it in public, is that um, Matthew was tossing in a couple of very beautiful, graceful, ornamental, uh, cadential mm -hmm. things. And to me, that was very appropriate because it, the vocabulary of the music, which is, I, I think, I agree with Ryan, very gallant style, seems to feel like these this type of decoration really belongs, right? The, Carol and I had a conversation about kind of where in a Bach aria it feels appropriate to add extra notes to ornament and when it doesn't, right? And this kind of piece, I think, is a very good kind of piece uh, to sort of play with. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, that was a good instinct on your part. Speaking of ornamental, too, is the, um, back to John's Reconstruction of the violin part again. This this gesture, the young, which is so ornate, um, and the text in the B section, Jesus um, kleinot by the light. He bestowed this jewel upon me, and it sort of sparkles, like what we hear in the third movement, the morning star. Yes, and I feel again, it's the way that Bach suddenly has ties movements together in a way that's not overt, that takes some digging. And I always wonder what Bach, if Bach's congregation would have grabbed onto that because of knowing these chorales so well. But I mean, that image of the jewel that this little, we talked about having the little pin that sparkles <laughs> like I've got faith. <laughs> and, and if you come to our concert tomorrow night, you'll hear another reference to Kleinot in a, a mm. very different cantata. This is an earlier piece, the cantata 12, where we have the little jewel, the badge, the reward, um, mm. directly contrasted with the struggle. Mm. So the first movement was this sort of community statement of faith. The second movement is very much a personal, inward one. And then the third movement is interesting because we have the duet, 
And there are the, it's, you guys are always sort of chasing each other. And it's not until the very end where they come together on their melismas, and it's this sort of unity with Christ. It's, I always see this as, it's the soul dialoguing with itself as it chases itself. And then you're in unity with Christ the moment that your melisma comes together. And they say the word praise. Yes. On the word praise. On the word praise. So um, the way, this reminds me so much of, so the, so the St. Thomas Cantor, two before God, was Johann Hermann Schein. You all sang the Schein motet last week. One of the things Schein did a lot of was, was these sort of chorale concertos. He would take a chorale to him, give it for, give it to a solo or a duet or a trio voice, and it was like this fantasia, I think is what you call it, yeah. or like a vocal chorale concerto. To me, this is the master shine influencing Bach, <laughs> because we get in the cello part, the opening is the first three notes of <laughs> but faster, and we get the sparkling star. And that's really all you get of the chorale tune. And then it just starts to go into this, you know, fantasia on the theme. And then we get the complete chorale tune throughout the entirety of the movement. But at times it's sort of like a Where's Waldo. And you have to <laughs> track where the chorale tune is. And my favorite moment, and I talk to the singers about this, um, it's toward the end of it. Um, the text is, He may sleep in ergeben. He will grant me heavenly life. And there's an octave displacement. So Molly sings, and then Carolyn the soprano up the octave. It's the same phrase that would have been sung in one octave, but we have this octave displacement. I think it's such a fantastic moment of Bach being clever Bach and wanting to find a new way to have this, this line tracked throughout. And then right after that is the descending line of the chorale tune, which was the continual in the opening movement. That is just basically a scale that takes you all the way down and it necessitates this gorgeous melisma where they come together symbolizing the unity of the soul of Christ. I have one last yes. thing to say, uh, again, as someone who sung this duet, um, it often happens when Bach pairs voices that are close to each other. So soprano alto or alto tenor or tenor bass, where um, I think the singers are challenged to mimic each other in certain registers and then become really different in other registers. <laughs> and the first phrase of this, um, the, the soprano and the alto are really basically singing the same notes. So the color can be very similar. And then the second line, uh, the soprano just simply goes up an octave and is suddenly in a completely different tessitura. Um, and I think that there, it, there's a lot of game going on, a lot of play, also with sound. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, am I you or am I me or, you know, which one is which? And um, that kind of sonic creativity is, I think, a, a really important part of really any, any duet singing. Is, is, is asking that question, you know, when, when should I come into that person's sound? When should I sing very differently, you know, insist on a different color? And, um, you know, how do I go back and forth between those two choices? Mm -hmm. In the fourth movement, which is sort of the linchpin, the central message of the cantata, and this idea of one receives salvation through faith, not through works alone. Um, and I conducted this piece, I think this is the fourth or fifth time I've done this piece now, and I've always saw this fourth movement as sort of chastising, sermonizing, um, almost self-righteous in a way. And in discussing it, 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 you know, this often happens with Bach, is that you, for me at least, is that it takes me two, three, four times to come around to looking at it in a different way. Um, and it was, it's a line actually in the tenor aria, out of the promptings of love, I've been described in this book of life, that led me to, so the texture in the bass aria, 
you mortals, do you long with me to gaze upon the face of God? To me, it feels incredibly like, do you want to be as good as I am? <laughs> Oh, and then you must rely on good works. Very sermonizing. Most recently, I've come around to this idea of it being a sense of warmth and joy. And like I am experiencing this as a believer, the, the salvation of God, and it's incredible. And again, this idea of join me in the club. Yes. Do you want to? Let's do this together in a way. Which leads me to a much more warm approach to the recit. Every other time I've had the orchestra give real strong accents at the beginning, sort of stark, really in your face. Um, so, and actually, um, Jared, you're the one that convinced me otherwise. And I think there's a sense of radiance and warmth and belonging in this recit and a way of teaching that says, there's, you know, we're in this together, there's a way to do this, and it's through your faith. You have to believe, and it's the whole, you know, and obviously, it's a century thing. We're, we're, believing that God's going to rise up to the earth. There's a lot of trust in the, in the idea of faith here. So I think the warmth of it helps the, um, the interpretation, and then it precipitates the next R. Did you want to say something about the uh, Yeah, I just um, want to, again, think about when I spoke a few minutes earlier, I was talking about this um, the challenge from this Lutheran theology perspective that the key to salvation is something that is not perceivable to the outside world. It's something internal mm -hmm. to your own soul. And I think that, that there's a very, very positive aspect to that and there's a somewhat negative aspect to that. The negative aspect is that A, there are people who are constantly trying to test you. Do you really believe? Show me that you really believe. Show me that you believe the right things as opposed to the wrong things. Um, you know, that was the, the whole reason for the Thirty Years' War, you know, which was, of course, over by box time, but the repercussions of it were still, you know, bouncing around Europe. That, I mean, even among Lutherans, there were, there were these horrible battles about, well, you, you were, you know, your faith is the wrong faith, or you, you know, you're holding that this particular doctrine is true. And um, the the other thing is that, from a Lutheran point of view, the the Catholic idea that that you must perform all these ritual actions um, was a, kind of a great burden, and it felt kind of false. Well, I'm just going to say my twenty Hail Marys and whatever. And so, in the positive thing, the idea that I can't twist myself in knots to try to, you know, torture myself and, and abase myself and all the other things that, that, that comes from that other tradition. And please, I'm not myself passing judgment on either faith tradition. But instead to say, I can actually feel connected to God just sheer faith alone. And I think when we look at Bach and Tadas, we actually see both of these messages. Sometimes we see that stern, you know, you better examine your heart and you better believe the right things because you're going to be in serious trouble if you don't. And we see the, it's all right. You're one of us. You believe God loves you because you love him. And in this cantata, I think we're very much on positive side. So, you know, being able to sort of hear the bass recit as, as comforting us mm -hmm. by saying, it's all right. Mm -hmm. You know you believe in him. And so, this is, you don't have to kill yourself being good. <laughs> mm -hmm. The bass aria, which is, I don't want to say liberal, but I, think I see it as pretty straightforward. There are three images. There's the faith that gives wings to the soul. Baptism is the seal of grace. And these two things make you blessed, is the essential. There are three parts to it. What I find interesting, musically speaking, is that Swalkenbach will get a motive um, that's passed around, and often melodic. I love that the motive is there's almost this signal motive that's in the lower strings and the continuum. Yeah, pop, pop. 
pa, 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 that's passed about in every single section of the text, and we hear it in different ways. To me, that's the most interesting thing about the aria, and the fact that Bach tries so hard, I feel like, to resist uh, text painting and liberal imagery until the very end, the final melisma, which to me, is the pouring of the blessed water of baptism. It's the most overt image, I think, through the entire piece that he does. And he's resisted for five movements. <laughs> and it's not until the end of the base area that he throws a little bit of that in. I, and I agree with you, but I think that the, the idea of the wings of the soul, it's such a strong and beautiful metaphor. Mm -hmm. um, I feel that there is a bit of soaring that happens. And, and there are shorter melismatic sort of swirling, turning passages in the, in the singer's voice more than really in the orchestra that I think um, help us imagine that image of, of you sort of launching yourself. You know, we, we had a lot of very up in the air pieces and particularly the duet which was imagining the heavenly life and the joy, right? And the aya is so joyful that you don't even have words for it. Um, but I, I think that, that some of those passages in the, in the bass voice to me, they're a little worth it. Hmm. The, the well, and I think also the yapapa underneath is the sort of bedrock of faith. That's the foundation which allows him to soar above it because we have that sturdy undercurrent of faith. Yeah. And this leads us to the final chorale. I talked about this in the rehearsal. Um, the uh, lower third scale degree at the beginning of the, the first um, phrase. I think as Bach often does, it gives us a little doubt about this idea of faith. Can I do this? Um, and then the very next phrase, he turns it back up to a G sharp, and there's a sense of release. And the last phrase of it, that basically, he says, you will never deny me what I have prom what you have promised me, um, and this will carry my sins and release me from their burden. And there's this almost evaporation, I feel like, that happens musically as the the shackles of sin are released from you in the end. Anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the turning from the sudden surprising lower third, the G natural, and then the, the turning it around, the word <laughs> Sarlaya, um, grant me or offer me faith. I, I still, for a Lutheran, very important that the human can do nothing on their own. It all has to come from God. So there's this sense of, I am now a supplicant. I, I need your help, right? And then you have the word verzeihen, which, you know, even in modern German means, excuse me, <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> and, and the sound of those two words, obviously, in rhyme with each other, Bach very neatly turns from this sort of supplicant thing to a, Ah, you will forgive me. I will, I will, I will then be right with you, and and then it's in a major case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. I just have a comment. I also think that that last phrase, "Das Eva mein Sündschuldiger," he carries my sins and releases me from my burden, is kind of underpinning the whole cantata as redemptive. So these. The whole thing. It, that's why I, I agree with Jared in the warmer context mm -hmm. of that aria. You know, it is kind of professorial in a way. You know, yeah. it, it, that it's 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 redemptive because because of Jesus. So I right. think that's a, such a beautiful and perfect. And also the text for the duet is so, is the the imagery is of the the, the relationship of Christ as the the bridegroom and near the bride and the right the wedding. It's just kind of cool how it goes from the first movement to being collective faith, second movement, solo faith, third movement, different relationship with Christ. Right. Yeah, it's kind of shots, which is such a colloquial word. Yeah. And and of course, all the imagery is what Ryan said earlier about that chorale and the fact that it's associated with the Annunciation um, is that not just Bach, but people who were working with this material connected the Annunciation to the Song of Songs, which is, mm -hmm. of course, in the Bible, the great love poem. Mm -hmm. 
And for most Christian traditions, the, the two figures are turned into the soul and Jesus. And of course, that makes you think of some other cantatas like Bach, Bach and Alice and things like that, where, where it becomes this um, rather dramatically characterized love relationship between the feminine sounding soul and the very clearly masculine Jesus. Sure. So they also keep it as the church, the church universal in Christ. That would be more of a Catholic thing. Uh, in, for Lutherans, it's almost always the soul. Yeah. So um, by introducing this chorale, which is associated with a very different time of year than Ascension, um, it basically says that this is what you get by your faith is that you get to have this loving relationship, this very personal, intimate, loving relationship. It, it's, I think, a very interesting and, and hard to, uh, we, we don't have any particular explanation for why this is here in this libretto. You know, it comes to that question that is asked so many times, you know, well, how are these, how are these decisions made? How were these librettos constructed? Did Bach decide to put this chorale here? Or was that a decision that was made pre-existing the composition of the piece? It's almost never possible to answer those questions. Sometimes we have um, booklets from the period that have lasted, have remained, that were published prior to Bach having composed the work. Then we know, oh, look, this libretto was exactly in this form before Bach touched it. Um, but often we don't have that, and, and sometimes we only have them after the fact. So the, the, it's, a, it's an open question that, that I am certainly not equipped to answer, um, whether Bach made his own changes. But it is, I think, a fa it, it, it's probably the most fascinating thing about the libretto, is why is this chorale so familiar? Um, and then, you know, what does it add to the story? And I think it's what Caroline is saying, is that it's sort of showing these different layers of relationship. Any other comments? In terms of uh, the rest of the Stephen Aria that I have, I, uh, I think back to my time as a middle school teacher. Um, <laughs> and this, this line of Yevstadlichen as like an attention getter. It's, <laughs> Now, as a teacher, sometimes <laughs> you're 50 middle schoolers, you have to you have to scare people into attention every once in a while, and then you can be sweet after that. <laughs> I do, mortal. <laughs> yeah, you're using all of the tools of the toolbox. <laughs> maybe maybe he said boom boom. Boom boom. Let's jump it. <laughs> That's great. Any other questions or things to add or anything? I was interested in the phrase women's book. Oh, yes. Oh, the Book of Love. Um, I don't know if this reminds me possibly, I don't know if they carried those around back then, but um, I was getting a small prayer book with a jewel in it. Hmm. It's also to me this image of like, you know, I'm inscribed in the book of life, like, you know, my name's on St. Peter's list. Yeah, there it is again. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in. The bouncers. The bouncers. The bouncers. Yeah, yeah, I'm on the bouncers <laughs> list. Yeah. <laughs> but also, I we also that was that thoughts of the morning star be the other side of ascension, like Jesus is already up there. Well, I think I do think there yeah. is that, especially it's this this choice, he will grant me heavenly life there above. Um, the idea that because he, we see him ascending, then that gives us this ultimate faith that we too mm -hmm. will ascend, right? This this um the sort of end goal of faith, of, of Christianity, that, that we will rise again, right? And our souls and eventually our bodies will be united in, in bliss. So um, that's one, one reason I feel that the, 
chorales and there is um, to sort of um, pick up that sense of personal resurrection. Um, yeah, I don't know about whether this is related to like a, 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 a tangible, um, I mean, it could be, it could be. Um, I agree with Ryan that the Lebensbuch and, and this whole idea of things being written down, um, we see it in other contexts. We see um, sometimes, especially with Zalma Frank, where we see, um, oh, you know, I've got my ledger book here and you've got a lot of sins over here, so, you know. <laughs> and then we have, you know, things getting scratched out. Well, and then later on, it's, yeah. you know, the seal of grace as though it's been embossed. Yeah. Right, right, right. So there, there are, it's, it, it's actually a very beautiful libretto when you think about it because it, it's, in, in a very graceful way without showing its erudition, it uses a lot of metaphorical language. Um, we're comfortable with the metaphors, but they're, they're woven in. It's, it's not like this heavy-handed, oh, here's another image, and here's another image. Um, you know, I will also say one last thing about the opening chorus, as we were talking about the Song of Songs and this, this sort of marriage of Jesus and the soul. And, um, in the open chorus, the little duets that mm -hmm. happen, the spread off of the tenor bass duet, that are moving often in these incredibly loving, pleasing sixths, yeah. which you really don't get a lot of in Bach. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was more something that you would hear from, like, you know, Kunau or Zelinsky or somebody, <laughs> something that would have happened in Dresden that was yeah. more of a you know, popular style. That was almost an operatic style. Yes. An operatic yes. love to it. And he gives us just these little two, he teases us in the opening movement with these little two du love duets that are what, four measures long? Uh -huh. And there's a little bit of foreshadowing to the soprano alto duet. I think someone's being baptized this Sunday. I just saw him. Yep. Yeah, there is a baptism. Yeah. 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 Yeah.